This is 2OF Entertainment. Good afternoon or good morning or good evening, wherever you are, Paul. So uh, yeah, yeah, well, it's still morning here and we're uh, doing well. And I'm on the road today a little bit, but we're just re working remotely. And uh, have my, I have my background that just follows me around everywhere. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I know, I, know, I know the feeling. Yeah, well, you well, know, live in this it, 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 It's me again. I'm, I'm, I'm in, the, I'm in the Stephen's uh, hot seat. So you've got me to contend with today, but... Well, uh, no problem. We have actually have an artist today that uh, has connections to Netherlands. So that's uh, just a nice yeah. segue. It's a nice segue for you to be part of what we're doing and today as yeah. well. And um, we wish Stephen well on his journey to, well, he's on the trip today, so doing his thing. But uh, yeah, we have, we have a, an artist today, um, Mel or Melissa Mulder. And uh, we're going to talk to her. She's a, a, a graduate of uh, Sheridan College and Humber, but she's also uh, studied flowers for over 25 years and with a, a Netherlands connection, um, studied with a certificate. I didn't realize she could do that, but I guess there are some in the botanicals. And we'll talk about how that's influenced her work. Like her work is really different. She's gone into a, a fresco style of uh, creating visual imagery uh, of uh, flowers and wildflowers and some of the natural things that she's doing. Let's just, we'll bring her in here and we'll, maybe we'll just start her okay, up. Okay, let's, let, let's do that. We'll just bring in Mel. Good so, morning. Uh, good, noon. good morning. Good morning. Good morning. <laughs> yeah, just excited, a little excited. I've been, I found out that you had Dutch connections as well. I'm not Dutch myself, but... I've been living here for I, I well well that's not strictly two because I now have a Dutch passport which I didn't last time I spoke to Paul so that's changed. That's amazing, so I've, yeah. So I have, I have dual nationality, but I'm, I consider myself to be a plastic Dutchman. So, <laughs> so uh, yeah, so uh, yeah, all this illustrated flowers and everything has has a huge history of that here. But um, yeah. I'm going to uh, leave you in the very capable hands of yeah. Paul, and um, yeah. I should be uh, listening, and um, well, I'll come back at the end of the show and just uh, say say my goodbyes then. But uh, have a great show, Paul. Great show, Mel. Thank you. And, um, Thanks, Thanks, David. See you soon. Bye bye. There we go. So, I see the lovely images in behind you in your studio there, and uh, we'll, we'll be bringing those up for people to look at here shortly, and uh, they'll be a little bit bigger. They can see what's going on, and uh, so. You're in, in Hamilton, Ontario. Correct. correct. Right. Mm -hmm. So you have a, I guess we were just talking recently, you had a bit of a Dutch connection. And uh, I do. How did, how, does that in, how did that influence, does that influence what you're doing, that Dutch connection? Like going back to, going back to Netherlands a little bit to study a little bit or online or, or how, yeah. how, are you, how are you working at, and we talk about this 25 years with working with flowers and the botanicals and how, yeah. how does that, how does that, how does that mesh with what you're doing today? Well, I think, you know, for, to take it from the beginning, um, you know, so, so much art has been created just based on the natural world, right? The inspiration of the natural world. Right. And that for me is where my whole adventure started. So um, as you mentioned, I did graduate from Sheridan College. Um, I was there in uh, a program and I loved it. But when I was in high school, so before my first round of college, I actually did um, a co-op in a floral shop. And that was just um, a whole new world, working into 3D, the art of the 3D. Um, not to mention balancing, keeping these things alive or bringing them back to life uh, often um, was just such uh, a very grounding experience. 
I, I don't know if you've experienced walking into a flower shop or, or now a flower section. Um, there's just, your, your whole body feels at peace. It's tranquil. And there's just something about the human connection to nature. We are nature. And um, the way that it plays out in my body, in my life, um, I've never really been able to separate myself from it. So once I graduated Sheridan, I went on to uh, study at Humber College in Toronto. And uh, one of the uh, near the end of the semester or near the end of the year, they put a phone number up on the board and they said, hey, go if you want to go to Holland, because that is the uh, between Holland and Germany, they had such an economy built on flowers. I think a lot of people know the history of that. Mm -hmm. um, and there was an opportunity for me to go. And so I jumped on that and I went and I worked out there and I went to school out there, lived out there and soaked in that perspective of um of the floral world and it just you know it just kind of gets into your blood it's like it, chlorophyll starts to run through your veins <laughs> it's really hard to get away from so incorporating that into my art was just a natural extension um, I just couldn't, when it came time to retire from the floral industry, I missed it with my whole being. And I was able to, um, you know, stumble upon or re-remember re the, the medium that I use and the ability to capture it and then take it to a new level of painting um, on these frescoes. and. It just fulfills me in a way that it's hard. It's very hard to explain. You know, nature is is in everything. The Fibonacci sequence, the the geometry, the beauty of all of these flowers is just so readily available to be captured in this particular medium um, and shared. And it takes you into nooks and crannies of the natural world that you normally just walk by. And I think. That is what keeps me coming back. That is what, you know, um, taking a look at the whole tree, but then looking at the portion of the tree, then you see that, you know, when you take a portion of a tree, it could be a tree itself, or it could look like a human walking or a family member. Um, just, you know, looking at these things on the micro level, you start to see a larger world at play. And so, it's just a constant um, hearkening back to my time in in Holland, in the Netherlands. I lived in Gouda and um, the beautiful experience, the cobblestone streets and this their preservation and cultivation of of the green spaces. I mean, every it's a lot, I mean England has it as well in in many ways, but you look at the cobblestone roads and the tiny courtyards that adorn their their little walk-ups, their little houses, and they take so much pride in decorating it in their own um, expression. And it's just something that uh, you know I I was able to bring into my art and just be inspired by it over and over again. So. so yeah, so are wildflowers a big part of what you're doing in Canada now? Or? Um, wildflowers, but I also work with, through my connections and my love in the industry, I was able to cultivate good relationships with local flower farmers. And so I spend a lot of time um, roaming the flower fields of a particular uh, local farm. And the, the farm is La Primavera Farm. And they have such an incredibly diverse section of flowers. Um, a lot of farms will specialize in five to seven varieties, but with Prima Vera Farms, it's just, you can see the passion of the farmer, the flower farmer, just by the diversity of flowers yeah. that he brings in. And yeah. so I'm very lucky to be able to, to make appointments to go to the farm and spend time in the fields harvesting. I've done some courses there. Uh, they've been very generous 
to let me use their space. They have a hundred year old barn or a hundred over a hundred year old barn that I would work in and bring my students to. And we walk into the flower fields and we trim and um, use whatever inspires us, whatever you're called to, which mm -hmm. makes it a beautiful personal experience. So mm -hmm. I've been very lucky that way. <laughs> Yeah, you know, you know, finding good resources is important, and uh, especially in your field of finding unique florals. I mean, thinking that you can actually go to a, a floral farm, like you know, there we have to realize that not everything's grown in a greenhouse, and uh, and you're mentioning that 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 smell, the smell of flowers, and if you go into a floral shop, the incense is intoxicating. I mean, it really all these perfumes are amalgamated together into a magic smell. And I guess it's relative to the sections you go through in the floral shop while they're working with them. But, um, you know, and the flower is kind of delicate, but the flower is, I always found it's sort of, oh, I don't know how to explain. Um, it's used for so many occasions, births and deaths. And it, it, it's sort of, a way of saying something without saying anything. When you give somebody a flower, it can be for love, for uh, it's a peace offering. It can be a lot of different things. And using this segue, like it, I call it a segue. It's something you can give to somebody that leads to something else. Yeah. Uh, it's uh, it's an unspoken word. It's a lot of those other little magic things uh, a flower can do that no nothing can do. A word can't do it. That's but right. Flower, but a That's flower, right. Yeah, it's funny when you mentioned the scent. Um, when I was in college, you know, I lived on uh, lived in a dorm, and all I was on an all girls floor, and the girls would just open up my door, and they sniff, they breathe <laughs> into my room because even though I didn't actually have flowers in my room, they just they always had this idea that my room and I didn't use chemical fresheners they're like it smells like a flower shop in here so it would be on my clothes like it was in my hair and on my clothes um from working in class with it and so they would just come in and they'd sniff and they'd be like thanks and then they'd close the door and it was just you know flowers as you say they're like they're almost like a portal a portal to joy a portal to love a portal to happiness they take you places, they open the door for conversation, um, for reflection. You know, if you're walking in the neighborhood and you're, you pass a beautiful garden and there's roses there, you, you stop. It's a portal to stop and sniff and pay attention to the world that you don't, you don't look at. You just forgo, you, you take for granted. But um, it's all, it's also a seasonal thing. It's very short life, generally mm -hmm. while it's in uh, blossom. Let me get David to start our first image up here, and we can go through, and people can get a feeling a little bit. I I, I love this shot. It's just it feels very Van Gogh to me, and just this starry night a little bit, and the the florals, and I think it's it's punchy, and it's so these are these are floor built on um, with uh, uh, plaster, I guess. Yeah, a, a yeah. Base, so uh, just like any um, casting, so if you were, you know, doing an investigation of some kind and you saw a footprint and you wanted to capture that, you would pour plaster or a plaster compound into that particular mold that's been made in the ground. It's the same, um, the same technique. So it's a relief technique where you're capturing the flowers without the actual flower being in there because flowers do decay that's the nature of them they're here and then they're gone um so i don't use the flower in the artwork it is the relief of the flower okay. uh, yeah which is the plaster base which which is the basis of a fresco um and then there i paint them and i just however i'm feeling inspired by it depending on the season or the music that I'm listening to or just the the experiment that I like to do, um, the way I want to push myself, the paint flows out onto this particular canvas and um, I use different techniques 
to preserve the actual relief. Um, and that's just how it sort of begins. Yeah. yeah. No, it's a good, beautiful textural thing as well. Mm -hmm. It's got a real, like it's taking three dimension onto, onto a two dimensional surface. So these are on canvas or are they on a board or? So they're actually, the full thing is a construction. Like I build my um, frames and I pour the plaster in the frame. And so the whole thing is like a, like a fresco taken off the wall, like a piece of plaster. Um, it's not plaster, it's a gypsum mix, but so it's, stronger but it's it's kind of like you would find a tablet or a relic of some kind um, unearthing that that yeah. it's the same sort of thing yeah yeah no they're <clears throat> yeah so do you use an acrylic for the staining of it and or the watercolor? ones that you yeah the ones you see today they're either watercolor like very good quality watercolor or acrylic yeah yeah and so how do they get sealed at the end or do they do you they do yes so I use a resin wax. A resin, yeah, wax is used quite a bit. Yeah, and even just in watercolors, just yes. so you don't have to frame them and things like that. People are doing that. So then, how is the presentation done? So this is a plaster base. Do is it framed normally, or do you leave them unframed? Or no, a lot of my clients, a lot of my collectors, leave them unframed. So the edges are usually white, or they're finished with a gold. Um, to sort of simulate that feeling of a relic, I guess. Um, yeah. And yeah. Um, yeah, then they're unframed. So like well, the ones that you see behind me here. Yeah. How thick would they be about? Um, Probably half an inch. Okay, yeah. So, so yeah, sometimes stand, if yeah, it's smaller, they, I'll do a thicker one, but yeah. They stand off the wall nicely. They, yeah, they have yeah. a nice, no, they have a, you know, just go on to another one here. Give people a little bit of feeling here. Yeah. No, there's a nice vibration in them. You know, they. I mean, these are very vein-like. You know, they, 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 the stems and that, and uh, it's it's very linear. Like there, it has a lot of really beautiful lines in 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 the work and uh, and substance. So I can I can see how you talk about how you you can dig in behind and the underscore and the undercut on a on, on a stem can give you a lot of shadow to one side. You say, well, you can enhance that. So if you were just to leave these, have you done any where they're not painted and you, oh, only, yeah. and you just depend on the light of the room yeah. to, to give you that embossed feeling, I guess I'll call it like it's uh, a, yeah, I have one here. You can take a look at it. It actually was, we had um, a family David, David dog. Yeah. We had a pet. Just hang and on. And get David to zoom in on that one if he's yeah. available there. Just wait a second, maybe. There we go. And people can sort of see that. Yeah. No, you can see how that emboss looks in there. Beautiful. And it's yeah. actually, it, it's uh, it's not called an emboss because that would be in, wouldn't it? It's uh, that's right. Yeah, yeah. it's the relief of it. It's a relief, yeah, mm -hmm. low relief form. So do you do any carving with chisels on them as well and cleaning up edges? Mm -hmm. or? Mm -hmm. yeah. Yep, yeah, I will scratch away at them, um, sand away things. You know, if something needs to receive in the background, it, it doesn't need as much detail, so you take some of that detail away. Right. Um, I can... Yeah, I, I carve in clouds and things, you know, whatever I want. <laughs> it's yeah. a beautiful mm. medium to work with. Yeah. yeah. Dusty at times, I would think, go as well, right? It's, do you have to use yeah. a respirator at all when you... I do, yeah. So when I'm uh, pouring, when I'm working with certain clays, I'll use a respirator. When I'm sanding, um, a lot of that can be combated if you moisten the piece. So mm -hmm. if you add um, a coating of water, it absorbs it, and then it, it doesn't dust into the air. So, yeah, yeah there's, there's ways around it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, and sharp chisels and things, mm -hmm. uh, things that flake off. But, no, they're beautiful. They're beautiful lines, and they have a lot. Let's just go on to another one here. So this, one's a little, this one feels a little bit more landscapey to me. You know, this has mm -hmm. got a, more so than a close-up of a botanical. This is this island with a tree on it. You know, it's yeah. just kind of a feeling. Yeah, a little bit more escapey, like I guess even That's building, 
yeah, building the reflections as if there's water in the foreground. So, yeah. These kind of remind me a lot of times they used to be three-dimensional ones that people would make similar to this. It would sit on their tables and they were actually poured, I guess, in the same fashion, maybe in some kind of stonework mixed, but they would collage them yeah. and they, they would actually add rocks to them and different things. So they build these little islands, but they became, I don't know, dust collect. I call them dust collectors. <laughs> they, they would sit they're almost like big, big paperweights, but they'd be <laughs> three-dimensional items that would be, more sculptural like in a three-dimensional manner where your works are nicely they're, they're meant for wall uh wall pieces so um no they mm -hmm. have a have you have you thought of ever working in like glass because i you know when i was at sheridan every day i would walk by the glass blowing studio and i like my whole soul wanted to be in that studio um i never went through with it and then later on um uh, when i finished as a floral designer unfortunately i had so much carpet tunnel that i wouldn't be able to do anything like that but um i i love the idea of, of pouring glass uh, into this sort of mold and being able to to do it this way absolutely with a, um, with a, yeah, with your mm -hmm. raw gypsum or plaster base, uh, you can go a lot of different ways, even into, into bronzes and different things. You know, yeah. they, they, they're they like a ceramic. So yeah. uh, they they can receive, you know, those different substrates. That okay, becomes well, let's, let's put this out. Whoever's watching, if there's a glass blower out there, if there's someone that's interested, I would totally love to collaborate on some pieces. I think mm -hmm. that would be... I don't know. I, I kind of, Paul, now that you've opened that vortex up, I would absolutely love that. That would be incredible. Well, a lot of it, though, is also you don't need a glass blower. Right. You need a person that just works in glass. Yeah. And they use a kiln yeah. to, to melt the glass, um, say, laying it in different layers on your, on your structures. I have no idea about what would need to be done, but that would be part of that collaboration. If somebody out there wants to collaborate with Melissa or Mel, I great. I mean, that would be a great thing to see. Love to have a show on that. You know? Yeah. Yeah. You know that what I do love in particular about this medium is there is, there's, you know, uh, air clarifying properties in using plaster like plaster is an earth friendly medium right um it's from the earth it returns to the earth of course plastic is from the earth as well <laughs> but um i really you know my first push was working in this in particular one that you're looking at uh was working with watercolor and just the the natural pigments on the natural surface to me really you know uh, it has air clarifying properties for your home you're not introducing any more plastics i think we've all had enough of that um and just the, the softness of it it naturally produces a very soft um a very soft patina on on the surfaces as it absorbs the color um it's so it's such a beautiful technique and it's such a beautiful thing to have in your home it, it's almost like a living thing <laughs> i i feel like um yeah. you know for vibrancy yeah the the um all of the other acrylics and things like that are are fairly important to use but they can be used sparingly so yeah would you work with an interior designer if they wanted to design some of these pieces into a permanent installation in somebody's home or business like oh you? yeah Absolutely. Uh, I myself have a giant one. I think it's four by three feet and it's above our fireplace. So the, and that one is actually is, is just natural. It's just the natural white of plaster, which mm. goes with absolutely everything. Like as I am, I am an artist. We also collect art. And yeah. so I have a few very important pieces, very beautiful pieces in my home. And I didn't want, um, I didn't want to compete with that. I didn't want, first of all, the fireplace is a beautiful thing. Um, I want the fire to be the focal. And then of course we have summer when the fireplace is not on. And so, uh, 
you know, as the winter approaches in, in the summer, you have a beautiful backdrop of, of a relief that is more just the natural. Right. Um, it has bulrushes and roses and all sorts of different woods and things like that in it. Um, but it's in the room there. I think there's always a case for quiet art you know, for texture and beauty and something that your eye can know exactly what it is and find interest, but then paired with brighter things and colorful things. I think there's always space for that. And so that's really where um, I work with interior designers to come up with quiet art, tranquil art um, in the natural, and then pair it with something that's vibrant and colorful for their yeah. focals. So. Yeah, sometimes we need those. Does it absorb sound a little bit as well? We do, yeah. 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 So I think mm -hmm. otherwise you get this echo in this room that mm -hmm. is, which is nice in its way, but it it's, can be kind of bothersome if it's just, and people feel you have to put, like you said, a wall full of canvases and color on the wall, which is nice to put a few, but there's accents, right? And it's, yeah. it's really about, um, and I, I, I'm kind of a believer in changing things up a little bit. So you move your collections around and it changes the environment of your, and the feeling in your rooms. So I really, uh, and these would actually, um, do a very nice justice to that. Mm -hmm. circles, I don't know. There are these things, <laughs> circles I can't, I can work with graphically, but, but I just think I, it's a, it's a hard, it's a hard shape to, put I guess in corporate and people are starting to use a lot of these now I've seen more of them than ever before mostly on the relief panels the larger uh, you know inch and a half panels that they're producing and people are painting panels like, especially in the small one foot you know that are the, the little one foot eight foot inch shows that are out there right now right and uh, how do you feel in designing in the circle is it a is it a challenge at times or is it a um I actually love it. I find it easier because, you know, just you already have one very large edge that moves your eye around. And so you can't not take a circular approach to it. So it, to me, for me, it feels easier <laughs> than, than having to make your eye move around the canvas, right? Yeah. This naturally does that. You naturally have a flow of you know going out and then coming in or moving in that direction so mm -hmm. i i enjoy it it is um these are for they were used in the pie art square show um so in toronto and so yeah. that was a, a beautiful experimentation then i went on to do um, a series of them with florals uh these were the some landscapes but um i really enjoyed it yeah yeah, yeah. Once so, again, it's like a portal, <laughs> a yeah. porthole or a portal. Oh. <laughs> a porthole, yeah. And looking out the ship hole, but mm -hmm. I think a lot of these things are kind of inspired even by uh, uh, plates that you people would hang on their walls. Uh, mm -hmm. People collected plates for years. Yeah, yeah. Uh, well, I know my mother did, and my wife still has a few plates that we we have around. But they, they, uh, and they usually have a hanger that they hang on, and you hang them on the wall. And uh, these ones are kind of nice in a way because you, they can be off cue a little bit, and it, you know where the square picture or rectangle, if it's off a little bit, it kind of if you're OCD a little bit, you want to go up and straighten that person's picture up yeah. <laughs> a little bit. Yeah. But uh, yeah. the the round ones, uh, you know, I think there's another one here. Yeah, mm -hmm. you could be off by a little bit in there, you know, and you think, oh well, like, you know. It just it looks kind of fun, but I noticed these ones you're doing landscapes of more so than a bouquet of flowers or a, a garden of flowers. Right. Um, these yeah. ones tend to be, um, but they're sculptural. I mean, I love seeing this root of this tree coming out and how you depict that and where it comes from. So, what are you using to describe this piece? Like you're using florals initially to make some of your other castings mm -hmm. and some of the different things you're working with, but what do you use for this one? Is this? Yeah, that's a great question. So in this particular piece, I gathered oak leaves. So all of the tree is comprised of oak leaves. And then the um, the trunk is actually just uh, pieces of wood. I'm not sure if I have, I don't have any on my desk right now, but I just would use, you know, go out and collect sticks. Like it's, 
this particular art, if you are the type of person that goes to the beach and comes home with rocks in your pocket or seashells, or you're out on a walk and you come home with acorns, this is the kind of art that you want to be making because you can oh, nice. preserve them in uh, in these pieces. Yeah. So does <clears throat> so does that leaf stay in the piece of work? No, it's just the relief no. for it. It just that's right. So yeah, yeah. Do you yeah. can you make can you make multiples of these or is it? A I could. Yeah. So what I would do is um, because the process is actually a reverse process. So you get whatever you put down, you're going to get the reverse of. Um, if you were going to make a copy of it, you have to realize that the the piece that you make is the reverse of it. Um, and then when you, I could take a silicone and create a mold on top of this, through this, of the reverse again of it. So then you get the actual, <laughs> it's a little complicated. But <laughs> no, it's understandable. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> then you get the actual uh, presentation that you put down in the first place. Yeah, so pretty much, yeah. yeah, pretty much every one that I do is an original, um, which in this, this kind of like AI climate, I don't, I don't actually believe that um, artificial intelligence is artificial. But anyways, in in this sort of scope, <clears throat> this is kind of going in the opposite direction, right? These, if you have one in your hands, you probably have an original. <laughs> yeah. So, well, yeah, I, I'm just saying uh, we've had other shows on AI and, you know, and that's development and it's teaching of itself throughout what we're doing. Uh, and art is trying to stay into the original realm of creating original art, um, trying to avoid replication by some other mechanical process uh, or another industry that wants to replicate what you have. But a lot of times... I, and, and I hate to say it, you know, these things can be done digitally uh, with digital printers now and 3D printing can produce just about anything, um, you know, especially this, if it's just in the white surface and then adding the color to it. But um, it, it's a really hard thing for artists to, I, I, I don't want them to, I guess, artists to avoid it by saying, oh, I want to produce something that you can't copy. And he said, and that's going to drive my whole work. And I said, well, you, you, now you're now you're doing art for a different reason, right? You're, you're doing art for avoiding replication, right? Rather than saying, do it my way. And you've got the way you, your color palette and the way you work with texture and, and, and the subject matter becomes unique, right? Okay. But, but so many people can, you can copy a Van Gogh painting. Like so many people have done that, the sunflowers, and they can be done with photo and make a giclée, and you have a replication of it. But it's not the original, okay. and there's some, you know what? There's there's some people that have spent many many hours trying to um, make a fake, and there are lots of them out there, really good fakes, probably better than the painting itself sometimes, right? Yeah. It smells, and it even smells new. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that's right. Cool. Yeah. I mean, but I'm saying I don't think artists should worry about that as much as they should just do the art they love to do. And, That's right. Uh, you know, you just I found you just got to move on. Yeah, you yeah. you and you typically are about ten years ahead of your following. Right? Right. So by the time you are now moving into new directions, people are just discovering that they oh they like that style of work. And you're going, gosh, I just moved on from there. I'm not doing that anymore. And you should have been around 10 years ago when I was trying to unload this stuff, you know? <laughs> yeah, absolutely. But your stuff sells well, does it not? It seems yes. Yeah. yeah. I have some um, collectors, so yeah. which, you know, they're, uh, they become friends. Yeah. <laughs> the people that um, have collected from me. They, they will often, if they see, I, I use Instagram primarily, and so I'll be, you know, putting something in stories or whatnot, and they're messaging me the minute they see it, and they're like, I think I might want this. <laughs> yeah. So as, I, as it unfolds, I'll keep them up to date, but a lot of the pieces sell um, even before they hit my website, so mm. um, which is 
such a blessing and it's so encouraging and it's so it's such a special connection when people connect with what you're doing where they're they're sort of resonating on a frequency that you're on you know they're like the flower lovers or the texture lovers or you know they want something beautiful and organic in their home but they're not really into watering plants and so this is the perfect combination to bring yes the indoors uh, the outdoors in and so so forth and um they yeah they're very encouraging and they, you know what i've noticed interestingly enough they have been a, you know a few of my collectors have been from with me from the very beginning so they have been watching me experiment um and when i do something new they're like quick to comment like that's amazing this is so new and i'm like i'm so excited like i get the energy in my body i'm so excited and then i when i receive that back they're like mel you're doing something new and i'm like you notice that's so cool uh they're so supportive and it's yeah. um it's a beautiful community feeling you know, <laughs> I, I, I see, you know, we, we should have a conversation off off screen here, but there's so many types of things you can go and directions you want to go. And I don't want to lead you down roads, but I could see these things being done on a cube, a, a, a wooden cube that would actually be attached to the wall, but becomes really three dimensional. And these these flowers could actually come outside of the cube into the cube right so i saw that when i looked at this one and i said well wouldn't that be cool if that was i could see that in three dimension around on the left side and the right side and the face yes. and the underside and the top side so it becomes a huge challenge but now this cube is sitting on a wall that is becoming a real three-dimensional floral mm -hmm. but it's in a square format or your yeah. round, or your round format like an egg head that's sitting on a wall that's mm -hmm. so many you know, when you look at things that we we typically want to create things that are two dimensional with mm -hmm. a three dimensional feeling, yeah. uh, um, part of it is, you know, availability. Canvases are, you know, you can stretch them or buy them already to go and certain things. And the industry has told us these things are, you know, saleable. They're economical at a certain. If you buy ten of them, they're this much money, and yeah. and in the way you go, and they're prepped and they're ready to go for you, right? Mm -hmm. how do you take that substrate and say okay how do i make that mine and yours has had a, got probably an exciting way of doing it where you say mm -hmm. i can just see this thing on three sides and a top and a bottom and you go now it's you know maybe it, it explodes out past the square i see some of them yeah. have that where they stick <laughs> over they stick yeah. out on the side right this way here sorry if you take a look at the bottom part of it, yeah, it's, you can see uh, that it's coming out. <laughs> it does, yeah. Right. So it comes out yeah. past it. It breaks, the, it breaks that surface tension of square edge. You know, it gives it an organic feeling. There's an organic living in within this a structure that is man-made structure, which is square. Yeah. So that's what's kind of unique about your stuff. Your stuff is, like I said before, it's organic and... It's living, but it's been kind of forced to live within the square shape or the rectangle shape. But if you can explode out past it, then it becomes just another portal. It's just square portal in your, yeah. This one feels very night-like, like I'm, I'm crawling around in the, in the, in the underbrush and the flowers and, you know, you're looking through this, uh, you know, I don't know, beautiful little, um, it's a menagerie. And maybe that's the word. It's kind of a menagerie. I, I want to see. Uh, I want to see some ladybugs in there. I just, just. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I do use uh, dragonflies and frogs. The ladybugs oh, yeah. I'll work on. I will do that for you. <laughs> yeah. Well, no, this, that's like, that's kind of cool. You know what? It just brings back that fun in your, your life as a, as a kid. Like you, I probably spent more time crawling around in the dirt and the ground and in the grass and looking at things in those days and not sort of science based, but just more interest. You know, and uh, my floral interests probably were more when I'm uh, as an artist, more so than when I was growing up. But I think mm -hmm. 
appreciating these things starts early in life i think i think yeah. and you're doing you know this is great justice people come into a, a gallery or, or go to a show where you're showing and saying oh i've seen things like that so people can relate to those where mm -hmm. If you're doing something in a surreal manner, uh, you say, well, I've never seen that before. You know, there's a giraffe with a fish head. I've never seen one of those before. But you've got you've got plants here. And you say, oh, I maybe I maybe know what that plant is. Or they ask you what that is and whether they're sweet peas or whether they're other things that are very vine-like, right? And they've got these little tentrils that are trying to crawl up other plants. And do you find that these pieces of work kind of have conversations between each other? If you put them on a wall, is there a is there an aura that's created in a show when you see a series of these put together? Oh, absolutely. Um, I currently have pieces at uh, the County Creative Gallery in Picton in Ontario. And I was there for the opening and it was just the most beautiful thing to be around the art when it was first received. It was the first time it was like so-called out in the wild <laughs> for me. Um, and to be able to just sit and watch people come up to uh, uh, Lori, the curator, she's also an artist, she curated all of my pieces together. And the magnetism of watching people come up and wanting to touch it, um, they just, yeah, it was very it, perplexing for them. It was, you know, it sparked things in their brain and the interest and the excitement around it was a really beautiful thing for me to be able to witness, you know, to watch people trying to figure out what the process is and what exactly is going on in that piece. Um, it was, it was a beautiful thing. And so to be able to be a part of that and watch people interact with that tells me that something was happening it tells me that they the pieces were talking to them and they were talking to each other and so yeah it was it was a really <laughs> fun experience to, for me as an artist to see how it resonates with people yeah i can see these things being larger like if this thing was floor floor to ceiling this piece here you want to walk into it you yeah. you you want to be really absorbed into this thing i i, I just it's for me, it's fun because I'm saying if I saw, say I saw a half a dozen of these nice squares on a wall with nice space between them, and I'm going, it's almost like if you did separate ones of bugs and, like you said, your dragonflies and things, but they were in the white space. In other words, they're transversing between these six panels. Mm -hmm. They become this little dot that carries the conversation through... Uh, an exciting piece. So all of them, they become an installation actually is what they become. And, uh, but if these things were floor to like eight foot high, but they become uh, floating spaces in a room rather than affixed to a wall, they become like a screen or a, a device that's there. But but I can see beautiful things. If you could work with a glass person on stuff like you could see this where it's translucent. You can see through it to the next level where glass can give you that transparency. Yeah. And it in this is beautiful. I mean, I'm not saying this is <laughs> you know, what you got is beautiful. <laughs> so I feel like when I when I occasionally I'll <laughs> I'll get off topic a little bit here, but that's okay. It, yeah, that's uh, great. It inspires um, a, a vision and inspiration. Like yeah. I don't know, like. Um, and I always see back to my own work, but I, I like botanicals and a bunch of things that I'll paint uh, and put into my works, but um, not to the extent that you're doing them. Uh, mine's, mine's more what what I think something looked like more so than specifically what something looked like. Yeah. But the three-dimensionality of it really gives a nice pop. Like it gives it a, you know, a lot of times we're fighting with depth of perception, like push this one back, bring this one forward, where one branch or tentacle is overlapped on another one mm -hmm. you've automatically done that right mm -hmm. and then a little bit of color you can push that branch back and a little bit of color you can bring one forward so now yeah. you you're you're, uh, you're painting the weaving of the garden right yeah yeah kind of, uh, yeah sometimes paul it feels like i'm cheating <laughs> <laughs> oh, I love I love it. <laughs> <laughs> cheating is good I mean, so many, they always ask, how long does it take you to do something? And you go, 
I, I rarely ever answer that question. It's it's like it's it's really hard to say. Well, it's embarrassing. I did it this morning and it's done. Uh, <laughs> but you know, sometimes they said you have to add in the drying time. You know, you 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 just you say, well, you know, it, it takes twenty years to figure out what to do. Maybe that vine wasn't meant to be there. It took a lot of years to edit to take. Don't put everything in. You know, you you've got to do some things. That's right. You you have to pay attention to negative space. You have to pay attention to the linear aspect that's in everything. Like every yeah. piece of nature stems from something. You can't ignore the stem. Um, you know, and so then that you're gingerly placing things in, and you're placing things in in layers. And of course, it's reverse. And so there's a lot of hurdles, mental hurdles you have to go through, and a lot of things get thrown out <laughs> because it didn't translate the way you wanted it to. But we've, yeah. we've had other interviews with other, other uh, artists as well. And early, one of the early ones was, was with, uh, and you should look up Bonnie McNabb. And uh, mm -hmm. Bonnie's work is more based on, it's all botanicals as well, but she is taking the color and texture from those plants and putting it into uh, onto cottons and materials and wearables. And she has received grants to do um, studying on them. And it's amazing yeah. what a plant gives back, yeah. you know, and in her way, it's led a whole new direction for her. And she's a painter as well, but, okay. but she lets the plant tell her what's going on, but it's, it's a design thing as well. But I think, when our members can talk to each other and share information that's what this show is about as well it's about finding out what other people are doing and showing and how things not say how things are done but say oh that's interesting maybe i should contact that person yeah. uh, and i and i'm open to that i said I, I like that our members do talk to each other and share information become collaborative shows uh, have opportunities to travel and uh and do those things and this is this is exciting this piece not only the, it's a color splash it's just this color you know that pops a page and things that maybe you not normally would see together and uh i think people need to you know it's a beautiful experience yeah thank you i i have on my website a tutorial on how to do these bases, oh, yes. and so it's right there for sharing and <laughs> you can go and explore the world that I've been working in. Yeah. Um, I'm so I'm so lucky because I was able to take my two passions, the floral world and the the art world, the pigment and flow and color, and um, smash them together to make this. Yeah. And the original inspiration actually came from um, my my father, when he was alive, we lived in the, the same house he grew up in, and he used to spend a lot of time dreaming underneath a tree in our yard, at the back portion of our yard. And when he, he had Alzheimer's, and when he started to, um, you know, fade into the next dimension, so to speak, I had this need to capture that tree, because the tree also was fading as well. It was um, a fruit tree that was nearing its end of life. And I just had this incredible connection between my father, the tree, and and having like this desire to at least be able to preserve something from the tree. And so that sort of became this, right? Um, capturing time. I was able to capture time in a way that I couldn't capture <laughs> with him. <laughs> so um, just sort of these particular pieces, they span time. I have the ability to touch summer in midwinter. <laughs> so uh, it's a, like, it's a beautiful expression and it's not, um, yeah, it challenges the senses in many ways. It pushes an artist because they're dealing with the different dimensions and there's a lot of thought that goes into the beforehand and then how you're going to navigate it after. And so I think like any artist, I would love to go and spend time in like a glass blowing studio or doing other 
forms of art because then that comes back and informs what I do. And so it would be a really fun thing to watch artists take this particular mm. medium and explore that. I think so mm. many beautiful things could come from it. Now we have talked about doing something like this in glass and you know, I like I would absolutely love that. I think it could be done with um also using uh resin, poured resin. Um, yeah, that you could come up with beautiful panels with resin. Um, I don't, I don't use resin at the moment. It's things that I've thought about, but I haven't really journeyed down that. I really love the, the pigment and and the plaster mm -hmm. just for the natural. Um, you know, I'm going down that natural route. I'm a bit yeah. of a hippie. You know? <laughs> yeah, resins, aren't, resins aren't real natural, but they do give a. Uh, there's a nice translucence that can be done with that. I think everything has its caustic edge about it. So you've got to be careful in, in the use of some of those materials. But mm -hmm. I think just leaving your mind open to um, the next level, where, you, where it goes from there, not forgetting where you were. And so many, I think, artists in, in a way are very fortunate that um, a lot of times we use our work to, I don't know, define, explain death um our own mortality our where are we going why are we here um and i find the real the real serious art and it can be pleasant to look at and things but are are asking questions about that why are we here what are we doing what you know where, what's our next level where are we going your dad the next stage where's the next place can i stay connected with my family throughout the stages or my there's so many questions we'll never really have answers to but yeah. in art we can uh they become like you said there's their portals yeah. um and i think and i'm assuming things um people who are your followers collectors probably look at it um their connection for themselves understanding themselves through other artwork and i think art bridges that gap a little bit maybe helps fill in an area that uh, of a puzzle of somebody's life and of understanding something and it could be just a scent or a smell or a texture or colors probably even to say oh that reminds me of my mother or that reminds me so there's a reason why it's on the wall or in the space in their living space they understand when they walk by that it's they get a feeling that responds to them again and if an artist can, can make those connections with people you've done your job right and and it's nice to be paid to do those jobs and i think uh some are paid way more than other ones are paid but it comes down to are you able to connect with people with right. with something in in a really uh, sincere way I think yeah. that's it comes down. It's not fake stuff. It's you, mm -hmm. you sincerely felt something, and people can sense that. This one looks complete. It feels like you are connected with the piece when you're working on it. So, mm -hmm. and your pieces all do that. They they all have this connection between them. They have a body of work that. Um, I mean, this is a gorgeous piece, and I love this one. It's horizontal, which is a little different than some of the other pieces, but it it just makes them all bigger i i would love to see walk into a room can you imagine walking into a room there's an eight by ten wall done like this and yeah. I, I would encourage any art gallery or museum or a place that is a uh, even botanical based or not to have one even like a just a bar relief style mm -hmm. uh, something so definitely reach out uh, to mel to mel on something like that because i think these are exciting and they they draw people come in they want to come in and look at it how how is it for people like touching stuff like that, the oils from your hands and things uh you know if it's sealed it's not a problem i i encourage it <laughs> but but not galleries so so yeah. do what when you're in the environment do what they do um but uh yeah. you know and I, you know in, in widening is so called an audience so, so yeah, they're almost braille like mm -hmm. so they can be therapeutic in yeah. certain sectors. So say in a hospital situation where it's in, a, in an area that could be touched and people can actually connect visually if they can or not visually uh, through, through hand touches. Have you ever worked with putting smell, sense, and 
into a, into your say your wax? Well, it. I mean the the reliefs are porous and so they would take on smell it would need to be reapplied in fact when i'm using things like sweet pea or lavender as i'm going through the process and the, the days following it you can still smell <laughs> on the piece that particular scent um, yeah. interestingly enough my dad because he did have alzheimer's um when he was at my home, he would often spend time looking at my large uh, natural piece above the fireplace and touching it. And yeah. so it was talking to him. It was stimulating him. It was um, he grew up, you know, hanging out on a farm in the summertime. And I, I like to think that he knew that he was a part of it. It was a familiar uh, experience for him. And so I think as we as humans spend 90% or more of our time inside, something about this sort of work speaks to us in a way, a very subtle way <laughs> that reawakens us, that re-reminds us of where we feel at home or where we feel tranquil, where we feel calm or stimulated depending on colors and things like that. But um, you know, it reminds us of our own natural, naturalness. This is probably one of your winter ones. Kind of yes. Yeah. Yeah. So, so people can say, this is, this is great. You've gone from florals that are growing in a, in a, in a garden in spring in the summer to here's an experience, uh, that's more, uh, winter like, mm -hmm. um, so just taking needles from uh, pine trees and, mm -hmm. and use those as a, as a base for, for subject matter. Yeah, so it's uh, yeah, it has a nice flow. We have just back to the garden again. Mm -hmm. I love poppies. Poppies are just one of those things that uh, a part of the popular family that, and then there's three in this one I see here. Uh, you know, especially the red poppy, but they're the leaves are translucent, and you've yeah. kind of captured that in some. You can see through them. You can see. Uh, different things. Um, they're, they're quite a dramatic flower. And I just love the stem on them because they, the stems are never straight. They yeah. just, they go in towards the sun and they go around things and they twist and turn and their lifespan's short, but yeah. it's vibrant, right? It just, yeah. it's a big splash. And I, so what, it, what would the pink flowers be that are the blossoms there? What kind of? Uh, we have uh, columbine in there and then we have um, um, what do we have? We've got columbine, some, some bleeding some heart, some daffodils. Yeah. Yeah. So it's a very, a very spring piece. Yeah. Yeah. No. Yeah. No, it's, <laughs> I, uh, years ago I had made, I had a befriended a, a lampshade and I had, I had a bunch of daisies and my garden was kind of falling at the end of the season and I used spray paint. And I just, I had actually some stain. I was staining my studio and I wanted this lamp in my studio to match what I was doing. So, and I just almost like a, a monoprint style where you lay the leaf on it and you sprayed around it and you layered one over top of the other and you just lightly missed it with a spray bomb. And it gives this kind of feeling that, and it, it made a nice motif and I just kept turning it around until, and then when the light shines through it, it was all kind of uh, warm umber, and sienna oh, yeah. that's all it was it's very monochromatic yeah but uh and it that makes kind of the silhouette is. come alive right you're creating these silhouettes and then you turn on the light and you're like oh, it's alive it's absolutely gorgeous it's alive, <laughs> it's alive. <laughs> but, the, the, you know the fern the ferns that are there but yeah. uh and and i guess i find I, I was actually making fern leaves out of out of I can't believe it. Car parts. So we can talk about that later. <laughs> the thing, but the uh, things you can do with different substrates. But anyway, I ended on your uh, on your winter scene. Unfortunately, it's heading towards us this season. Well, you know what? It, it does inspire and it is a breathing space uh, for us to do our work in our studios and get our other stuff done. I know some people are kind of plein air painters outside and they'll 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 jump into the winter and away they go and i know there's a lot of good winter shows coming up and uh throughout we can talk to david anytime he wants to come in and we'll there we go 
Yeah. Hello, yeah, yeah, fascinated by it all. Yeah, I thought uh, uh, Paul's given you lots of ideas, Mel. I'm sure of that. You know, certainly these all of ideas. Big... I just don't have any ambition to do it myself. Yeah, <laughs> just huge <laughs> walls covered with these reliefs. I mean, why not? Uh, it's always my, always our task, my task, uh, Stephen's task when he's on the show, to ask the nitty gritty. So, um, if somebody wanted to purchase uh, one of your uh, one of your pieces of art, and what sort of price range are, are, are you starting at? Oh well, they're very affordable. <laughs> I'm not one of those ones that make oodles off of my art. <laughs> I do enough to keep me going, and uh, yeah. So you're looking at. Oh, the smallest ones, maybe $150 to $300 for a square foot. And then I think probably the most expensive one would be less than $800 on my website. Um, there's factors you have to think about. Like this is, you know, a hunk of nature. Um, so you want to make sure that it's anchored properly in your home. There is weight factor if we're shipping internationally. Uh, so there's some things that um, that have to be thought about when you're purchasing something like this. You don't want to just put a little tiny nail on and hang it, you know? So, so definitely large things, wall scale things need to be planned for. Um, seasonally, they need to be planned for. So for commissions and things like that, clearly I can't do wildflowers in the winter time i don't have them so <laughs> unless we want to go somewhere we can find them <laughs> but uh, yeah. Well, yeah. Have, you, have you ever used uh like paper pulp and glue as your substrate instead of so they become paper reliefs more so I, than plastic yeah. become quite light actually. yeah Yes, that's right. The pa a paper, yeah, you can definitely do that. I have seen that done. I haven't done it myself, but um, actually I was able to, I had a beautiful, I captured a beautiful magnolia and um, I silicone molded that particular capture. And so in the winter time, I'm able to fill the silicone mold with water and create blocks of uh, magnolia ice. But anyways, <laughs> that's like, that's my urge for, for glass, you know, yeah, well, <laughs> all like you get nail on the head. Yeah, I, think, I think glass is your next level. Mm -hmm. yeah, it certainly sounds like you've got a lot to, to think about, Mel, and, uh, and also, uh, yeah, a lot of things to discuss with Paul. Maybe you should uh, make another appointment with him. I think our, our time is up for today, uh, Paul. That, that, uh, yeah, time that's time is moving on. Thank you. Yeah, um, th you know, thank you so much for being on the show. Uh, all we just said to everybody is if you like uh, what you've seen, there's a whole series of different artists that, uh, that Paul has interviewed. Um, Equally as good as Mel, and I don't mean that in a disrespectful way, but there's some in some fascinating people. But um, yeah, we're lucky to have uh, had Mel on the show today. And if you like what you've seen, subscribe and like. And um, well, we'll see you all next time. Mel, stay with us after till the credits have run, because uh, Paul likes to do some housekeeping. But mm -hmm. until the next time, everybody, thank you so much for watching. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Bye bye. Bye bye.